Okay, so I propose we we start. Um, so welcome everyone to this event organized at UCL as part of the UNESCO's World Logic Day. Um, it is a great pleasure to, uh, to host Professor Samson Abramsky from Oxford, uh, who will give a talk. And then this will be followed by a panel with several people from institutions across London and UCL, and we will have a discussion. And the overall theme for today is logical journeys. And the idea uh, we have is, is to basically discuss broadly the use of logic in, in different domains and um, the challenges that logic faces when in uh, being applied to emerging paradigms, such as machine learning or cyber physical systems or quantum computing. Um, so thanks for joining us today and I hope you, you enjoy today's event. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions both during the talk and then during the panel. Please add your questions to the Q&A if you can, because then uh, questions can be upvoted um, and we can. I will be monitoring the chat. So even if you ask questions on the normal chat, I will, um, I will be monitoring it and interrupting something at points where I think is convenient. Um, and then there will be ample time after the talk to, uh, to ask questions. Um, so Samson, if you wanna share your Yep. Screen while I introduce you, that would be great. Okay, I'll go ahead. And, uh... So, yeah, it is my, my great pleasure to introduce Professor Samson Abramsky from uh, Oxford University. He uh, has been a very influential logician for many years, and it is perhaps one of the most well known people applying logic in a wide range of uh, fields including uh, economics and quantum computing and uh, at the same time Samson is also a usually popular lecturer in many summer schools and, and events for junior researchers and has influenced many of our careers including my own so having said that and without further ado I will give the floor to uh, Samson thank you thank you very much Anachandra and thanks to all the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, participate in this very nice event on World Logic Day. Um, sort of the idea of an official World Logic Day is kind of uh, took me aback at first thought. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it's quite inspiring to think of people all across the world coming together on this day to share their enthusiasms and ideas, or enthusiasm for logic and ideas uh, about it. So, um, it's very nice to be part of this event. Now, uh, one, one of the things about logic is that it has many different faces. Um, an interesting point is it's an ancient discipline, but if you think about it, there are, if not no, then hardly any departments of logic. So it's certainly a subject, but it isn't the sort of subject in which there is a department <clears throat> just, uh, just for logic. Uh, in, instead, logic usually lives in, well, computer science departments for many of us, mathematics, philosophy, and also in smaller concentrations in a wide range of other things, linguistics, psychology, foundations of physics, law, economics, game theory, and many others. I've heard uh, some distinguished colleagues bemoan the fact that there are no departments of logic, but I personally think this is a good thing, and it relates to the, our general theme in this meeting of, of logical journeys. Um, I think it's good that logic doesn't just sit by itself, but has to but find its place uh, among, other, among a variety of disciplines. So, um, we, I mean, taking one of the most prominent uh, conferences uh, in the computer science field featuring logic, logic in computer science, the, the, the name says it all. I, I mean, I, I go back far enough that I attended the second LICS, which took place in 1987. Maybe some people uh, uh, attending this meeting <laughs> weren't born then, I don't know. But at any rate, that was the, uh, this was just starting then. And the paper I presented there was Domain Theory and Logical Thought. This was essentially what my 
um, uh, sort of central point in my my own thesis work. Um, uh, and uh, I'll be saying a little bit more about that later. Um, so certainly uh, logic has been part of the foundations of computation from the start. There's a famous book by John McCarthy. I don't know how many people know it. I highly recommend reading it. It's kind of a visionary document written in 1962. Um, and it contains, somehow it prefigured many of the later developments. And it has a famous statement in it. It's reasonable to hope that the relationship between mathematical logic and computation will be as fruitful in the next century as that between analysis and physics in the last. Um, that's often been kind of cited as a, uh, a kind of founding motto in a sense for logic in computer science. And it, it's sort of since that was 60 years ago, it's kind of interesting to reflect on um, uh, you know, whether those 60 years have borne out this, uh, this hope or this, uh, this reasonable hope that, Mac that McCarthy um, um, gave in, in 1962. I'm not going to try and make an assessment of that, uh, but uh, it's something we, we, we may like to reflect on. I also think that his conception of logic, and notice he refers to mathematical logic, I mean, perfectly reasonably at the time, um, uh, reflected a, a, maybe a, a somewhat fixed and narrow view of logic. Um, and indeed, the question is, what is logic anyway? If we're, since we're celebrating logic, and we've said it has many faces and it occurs in many different uh, areas and guises, so what is logic anyway? And coming back to Licks, there was a sort of debate that ran for a number of years after Lick started, roughly along the lines of, should logic be interpreted broadly or narrowly? So there were some people uh, who um, really would have preferred the narrow view. I won't name names, but some uh, very distinguished colleagues. And the, historically, uh, Lix actually grew out of an earlier conference series on logics of programs. So from that point of view, there was a rather narrow and definite idea of how logic interfaced with computer science. And I think it's fair to say that over time, the broader view uh, has prevailed. And I'm, I'm certainly happy about that. I've always advocated the broad view. And for me, logic is most interesting when it goes on its travels and meets other ideas rather than when it stays at home. So um, I, I think this is, uh, and this brings us to our theme of uh, logical journeys. Um, I've, en I've encountered resistance to this point of view, sometimes even papers being rejected or nearly rejected because they're not in the scope of the conference. And sometimes the papers that were uh, sort of opposed because they weren't in the scope of the conference have ended up being used in future to justify a broader scope for the conference. And that's actually one of the ways that Lix has grown over the years as an example and other, other meetings too. So um, the scope is essentially what we make it. Of course, there has to be some spirit of what the whole enterprise is about, but um, we, we have, uh, it's a dynamic and ongoing process to say what the scope of logic is and the forms that it can take. So I indulge myself by having a, uh, so these, these verses from the Spanish poet Antonio Machado, which I um, found recently, I think is rather beautiful. Um, Traveller, there is no road. Um, we have to make the road uh, by, by walking it. Okay, well, uh, to come to the things I would like to talk about more specifically, uh, I want to take something that relates to the history of our subject, but also to, and some of the journeys that logic has taken in its time in computer science from the perspective of some of my own, uh, my own travels uh, with, with logic, um, which relate to many of these, certainly very much to this theme of logical journeys. And what I'm gonna try and do, I, I hope I'll manage to do it, um, is to rather than going in an, a one particular journey in depth, to try and talk about three uh, things more briefly, um, trying to give the essential ideas without delving too much into details, 
Uh, so a trilogy of vignettes to illustrate this idea of logic journeying uh, in, in, in different directions and bringing, uh, connecting with different things uh, in its, uh, in its uh, history with, uh, in computer science. So the three things I'd like to talk about our duality theory, where the iconic figure is, uh, is Marshall Stone from Stone Duality. Actually, George Boole plays a, plays a role in that as well, of course, because of Boolean algebras in Stone Duality. Then there's logic and probability, where the, the sort of uh, reference figures are Boole again and John Bell, the physicist. And finally, uh, logic of contextuality, where it's Boole yet again, uh, and also uh, the logicians Simon Cochin and Ernst Specker. Uh, Bull, incidentally, was a, was a pioneer of both logic and probability, and we'll see uh, elements of both of that in, in this uh, talk. So indeed, let's begin with uh, duality theory and coming back to that uh, paper from uh, quite a long time ago about domain theory and logical form. So there's George Boole and Marshall Stone. Stone was primarily an analyst working in functional analysis, and he actually proved uh, seminal results in, um, uh, which are important for the foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, but um, he's very famous to logicians because of Stone duality, the Stone representation theorem for Boolean algebra, a similar result for distributive lattices and so on, which go back to the 1930s. Uh, so I'd like to briefly revisit this work on domain theory and logical form, which did appear in a short version in that Lix 1987, and the full version uh, is in Annals of Pure and Applied Logic from uh, um, <clears throat> a bit later. Okay, so what's the basic intuition for this work, and why does this uh, sort of abstract duality theory come up in a very natural way in things we're interested in in computer science. So for a basic intuition, consider a relation P satisfies phi, where P is a program and phi is a property. This is the sort of thing we're always interested in when we're doing a program verification, for example. So we can look at this in two ways. There's the denotational view, where P is a point in a, in a, a mathematical space uh, I'm just going to hide the video panel because it's distracting me. And uh, yes, that means that I... Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I've, um, how do I... Yep, okay. I think I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to go back into full screen. But hopefully that's okay. So um, yeah, we can we can either take the denotational view where p is a point in a mathematical space, um, uh, in some we think of some type in the programming language, and then we can interpret the property in a semantic way, extensionally as the set of points in that space which satisfy the property. So p satisfies phi from that point of view just means that the denotation of P is a member of the property uh, denoted by phi. And then there's the axiomatic view. We axiomatize this P satisfies phi as a logical theory of which properties P satisfies. So think of Hall logic or something like that. If we think of properties as observations, we can then seek to construct the meaning of P out of the properties it satisfies. So we think that the denotation of P is the set of properties that it satisfies. And then you see that P satisfies phi means that phi is a member of this set, uh, this property denotation of P. So notice that the, the meaning here is denotation of P is a member of this set. And this one here is that the um, phi is a member of the uh, of this logical denotation coming out of axiomatics of P. Um, so how can we reconcile these views and indeed bring them into exact correspondence? And this is exactly what the beautiful setting of stone duality gives us a mathematical framework to do. So the classic result, the stone representation theorem from 1931, uh, the problem was given an abstract Boolean algebra represented as a concrete algebra of sets. 
Uh, and the way, the way Stone did it, uh, the classical way, is to form the space of ultrafilters over the Boolean algebra, or equivalently, if you think of homomorphisms into the two element Boolean algebra, you look at the things that are mapped to true. Um, so the, the, if you like the characteristic function for some predicate. Uh, so this would be the space of points over um, the Boolean algebra. And we can topologize this in a natural way by taking as basic opens the, the sets of, of ultra filters which satisfy a given, a given element of the Boolean algebra, which map it into one, into true. Uh, and on the other hand, um, if we're um, if we if we have a this this space turns out to be what's known as a stone space, a particular kind of compact Hausdorff space, and then it turns out that we recover the Boolean algebra B as the lattice of um, closed clopen sets, sets that are both closed and open of this space of points. So here, and since that's in particular uh, a lattice of sets then uh, we've recovered a concrete representation of the abstract Boolean algebra B as some collection of uh, some uh, um, elements of a, of a power set over here. So that's the Stone representation theorem. And part of that was to, we could then exactly identify the spaces that arise in this way. They're actually, from the point of view of topology, somewhat pathological, they're totally disconnected compact Hausdorff spaces. Uh, and these are what are now known as stone spaces. And now you see the duality kicks in because if we go in the other way around, start with one of these stone spaces, take its concrete Boolean algebra of clopen sets, and then take the points over this Boolean algebra, again, we recover up to isomorphism, the stone space that we uh, started off with. So this is the, the classic theorem of Stone. Now, this sounds like topology. I mean, this was certainly the perspective that Stone was coming from. One of his famous sayings, uh, which I took as an inspiration in, in that work on domains in logical form, uh, it was the, the motto, always topologize. And there's a lot to be said for that, which roughly means don't just take set theory structure, but seek to find a topology on, on, uh, on things as well. But there's also a logical reading of stone duality. We can think of the Boolean algebra as the Lindenbaum algebra of a propositional theory. We know that we can turn any propositional theory with some axioms into a Boolean algebra by modding out by logical equivalence. And then the points, these two valued homomorphisms are models for this theory. Uh, and in fact, the compactness of this, uh, this stone space um, subsumes the compactness theorem of logic. And the existence of enough points to achieve the above isomorphisms, these correspondences in both, both ways around, is, it subsumes the completeness theorem because the essential point is that whenever, for example, we cannot prove that phi entails psi, then there is a model that witnesses it. There's a model that satisfies phi and does not satisfy psi. I mean, if you think of the way you prove a completeness theorem, uh, this is exactly the crucial step. Um, and we can have a more general, a more, uh, bringing it a bit more up to date. Stone did his work before category theory, but uh, in some sense, category theory is, is sort of is almost irresistible following um, Stone's work, as well, of course, as other, other kind of uh, things coming from topology. And this is a point made by Peter Johnston in his, in his beautiful book on stone spaces. So the more modern view is that we have some category of spaces and some category of theories. We have these correspondences, as we've already said, between um, uh, spaces and uh, um, logical theories, Boolean, uh, al Boolean algebras, or it could be more general kinds of uh, heighting algebras, intuitionistic theories or whatever. And on the other hand, we can come back in terms of points. And the fact that we bounce back and forth with isomorphisms is saying that there's an equivalence of categories. That's the modern way of talking about, dual more modern way of talking about duality theory. And of course, this includes now maps as well as spaces and algebras. So we're not just looking at the objects, we're looking at the morphisms as well. And in fact, um, 
the uh, so a continuous map goes into a kind of predicate transformer on the on the boole on the logical algebras uh, and um, a lot and less again uh, a sort of deeper fact is that such uh, predicate transformers or we can think of them as generalized modal operators transform into continuous maps on the spaces. So this is important that it, it greatly generalizes uh, the idea that goes back to Dijkstra uh, about predicate transformers and um, the fact that there's in fact a duality between the state transformer point of view, the sort of standard denotational view of a program as a function mapping states to states. Um, and this is equivalent to the um, the sort of uh, point of view where, where programs are thought of as transformers that map properties of the output, the post conditions back to properties of the input preconditions, in other words. Um, so uh, this is also being subsumed by this uh, stone duality perspective. And what it's about as computer science is connecting program logics and semantics. We can actually in this way derive a program logic from a semantics and vice versa in such a way that each uniquely determines the other. And in fact, we can compositionally and effectively derive program logics for complex semantic domains. And what underlies this is a generalized kind of dynamic logic covering all the constructs of denotational semantics, higher order functions, recursive types, non-determinism, et cetera. And we use the logical form to unpack the structure of complex recursively defined semantic domains. We sort of take the semantic description and convert it into formulas we can write down and use to investigate properties of the domains. So just to say very briefly, if you think about some kind of meta language for writing semantic definitions. And for many people, by the way, this will look more, if you think about this, I mean, this was done, as I say, in, in, in going back to 1980s, one was mainly thinking of a domain theoretic paradigm. But if you think of all this as happening over sets, then uh, this, you may like to think of co-algebraic modal logic, which came a bit later, uh, works in a, usually in a set theoretic setting, is very much in the same spirit. So we have some types, think of these as ways of building up functors, polynomial functors, and a bit more because we have function types and we have, uh, well, this would be like power set, but here with domains, it would be a power domain. And we have recursion. And uh, with co-algebras, we'd we'll be talking about final co-algebras. With domains, we have the, the fact that initial algebras and final algebras, co-algebras coincide. So we have these types, we have type terms in a meta language, some kind of type lambda calculus. And the program is to assign in a syntax directed or compositional fashion, a propositional theory to each type, such that the Lindenbaum algebra of this theory is the stone dual of the domain associated in the conventional denotational semantics to that type. And then we can axiomatize the meanings of terms uh, as uh, either a kind of whole logic or a kind of dynamic logic. And this is all done systematically. We just, uh, if you write down the definitions of the semantics, uh, uh, the, the whole logical apparatus is um, uh, unrolls automatically. So this requires giving constructions on theories that yield the stone, stone duels of denotational constructions such as function spaces and power domains. Um, and uh, recursive types are handled by inductive definitions of the logic. So as you I keep unfolding the logic, you get arbitrary nestings of generalized modality. So this is why there is a very natural comparison with the work that's been developing uh, uh, subsequently in the last 20 years or so on co-algebraic logic. So in this way, we can read off presentations of complex semantic domains as propositional theories hence unpacking their structure. Um, yeah, okay, so here are some technicalities about the kind of domains that, are, that would come up here. I, we don't need to go into that. Obviously there are technical issues that arise um, and some things, uh, some things go through smoothly, some things are significantly difficult. We, I mean, function spaces don't appear in, in, in co-algebras for very good reasons. Um, and uh, they can be mastered in the domain theory setting, but there are definite 
uh, technical uh, obstructions. So, I mean, just to say very briefly, the hardest, if you're interested, obviously you can look at the, look at the papers, the, the hardest cases for function spaces, how domains connect to the via torus construction, domain equations, as we've said, fall out as inductive constructions of theories. And we can then use these tools to analyze various key cases effectively. And this is why we really get a bit of this. So examples would be studies of the lazy lambda calculus, which has also sort of developed into an ongoing object of study, a domain equation for bisimulation, and the Cook's tour of the finite tree non well founded sets, which really does. Uh, that's the, if you want a readable. Uh, re relatively readable and succinct presentation. A lot of these ideas are very much, as you see, a Cook's tour in the spirit of logical journeys. I particularly represent, uh, uh, would recommend, if you're curious to learn more, that last paper, the Cook's tour paper, which is you can find on the, you can find online, for example, on the archive. I'll just make one remark about the, the maybe I'll skip the remark about domain theory since I guess um, we're not, uh, we should move on. But uh, I, I'll just mention there's been a lot of uh, work that's come uh, in the following in this tradition, developing things tremendously. I've already mentioned coalgebraic logic, and the Stone coalgebra's work is actually very much related to the um, Cook's Tour paper that I was just mentioning. And we can go away from the classical, the more standard setting of locales and heighting algebras into things like quantiles, which have been studied a lot by Pedro Rosenda and others. Um, and let me mention some beautiful papers which are appearing in, will appear in the forthcoming volume in the series Outstanding Contributions to Logic, which Manoush and Alessandra Palmigiano are editing uh, rela uh, relating to my work. So there's beautiful papers by May Gurka, Thomas, Thomas Jackal, and Luca Reggio on a Cook's tour of duality and logic paper by Alex Kurtz, Andrew Mushir, and Achim Jung on stone duality for relations, and um, a fantastic team, including Alexander has written this uh, paper, which itself is a sort of culmination of a, a, a previous literature about looking at minimization of automata using tools from duality theory, um, which is, uh, uh, beautiful, uh, all of these are beautiful contributions. So it's very much an ongoing uh, stream of work. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about that. As I say, if you, um, I, I hope some of you may be, uh, who aren't already kind of into this sort of material may, may be interested to look at some of that. It is an ongoing topic of interest. And I, you may like to look at the Cook's Tour paper perhaps. Well, let me come on to my second vignette which is, uh, concerns logic and probability. And this remarkable passage from George Boole in the uh, mid 19th century to John Bell in the mid 20th century. Um, they, Bell was a physicist. Um, his day job was in uh, high energy physics, um, but he did these remarkable foundational papers at a time when it was very unfashionable to do that which in many ways laid the basis for all of our modern quantum information and computation, as well as being some of the most remarkable results in the foundations of physics, which we're still trying to understand, but which also have ramifications right now in quantum cryptography, quantum computation, and much more. So of course, George Bull was a pioneer of both logic and probability. And we can certainly say, we can certainly claim him also for computer science, um, every day, programs are doing uh, millions, millions of lines of code are doing computations of Boolean algebra to control in the control structures of the code, uh, manipulating Boolean values, as we call them, and we, we conceptualize bits as Booleans. Um, and of course, uh, Boolean algebra underlies uh, logic circuits and all of digital hardware. Now, the first point I want to, the first, this connection I want to point out is between Boole's work in probability from the 1850s. And by the way, there's a beautiful paper by him, which is easy to access online and which is still very readable. And this idea of Bell inequality is fundamental to Bell's theorem, non-locality, quantum information and computation. This was first pointed out, as far as I know, by the 
uh, philosopher of science, Itamar Pitofsky, in his paper in the 90s on George Boole's conditions of possible experience and the quantum puzzle. And uh, I discussed it in a, in a paper I contributed to a recent volume in memory of, um, of Itamar, who uh, sadly uh, passed away a few years ago. Okay, so what is this conditions of possible experience? So Pitofsky beautifully summarizes what the, the problem that, that Bill raised. We're given rational numbers which indicate the relative frequencies of certain events. If no logical relations obtain among the events, then the only constraints imposed are that they each be non-negative and less than one. In other words, they're probabilities in the usual sense. But if the events are logically interconnected, there are further equalities or inequalities that obtain among the numbers. The problem then is to determine the numerical relations among frequencies in terms of equalities and inequalities, which are induced by a set of logical relations among the events. The equalities and inequalities are called conditions of possible experience. It's possible that this resonant phrase was kind of intended slightly facetiously by uh, Boole as a sort of a skit on the philosopher Kant. But anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful paper. So more formally, we're given basic events and Boolean functions of these events, uh, which we can think of just as propositional formulas. And we're given probabilities associated with these events. And what we're asking is what are the numerical relationships between the probabilities um, which follow from the logical relationships between the events. So here, and with apologies for people who've seen me present this before, but um, some of them as recently as yesterday, but uh, it's, uh, it is rather beautiful. So um, we have some propositional formulas uh, and we're going to assume by way of a logical relationship between these. And so just as we were saying in our, in our, in our description of the, of the of Boole's problem, um, so we associate probabilities and the logical relationship between these events that we take is just that they're not simultaneously satisfiable. Um, and in that case, any n minus one of them uh, must imply the negation of the nth. We're working just in classical propositional calculus. Or equivalently, the, if the nth is true, then one of the others must be false. So then using a very little bit of probability, so here this uh, monitor, this, uh, this is an inclusion of the, uh, if we think of these as events, so that translates into an inequality among the probabilities. And since the probability of a union is less than or equal to the sum of the probabilities, that's a, so actually often known as Boole's inequality. It's a, it's a very simple, probable, a very basic uh, property of probability. And then we expand the probability of the complement of an event. We collect terms and we find this inequality. But under this assumption, not, not simultaneously satisfiable, but no other assumption, um, then uh, the sum of these probabilities must be uh, bounded by n minus one. And so this is the most simple kind of what we could, um, of uh, this kind of, which I'm gonna call logical Bell inequality. A bit more generally, rather than just saying that the family is inconsistent, we can say it's K consistent if the size of the largest consistent subfamily is K. This idea of K consistency is familiar from uh, computational complexity and from constraint satisfaction. So just that they can't always satisfy the most k can be satisfied. And by a mild generalization of the previous argument, then we can bound. Uh, I hope you're still hearing me. I just saw that the internet connection is unstable. I guess I'll get a message if there's a problem. Anyway, what we get is a bound on the sum of the probabilities being less than or equal to k. So it's not easy to, it's not difficult, I should say, to show that a bit harder and somewhat remarkably, all Bell inequalities or all the kind of inequalities that Bull was asking for uh, arise in exactly this way. So here's the result in a paper with Lucian Hardy. A rational inequality is satisfied by all, well, um, um, yeah, we don't need to go into the details exactly if it's equivalent to a logical Bell inequality of the above form. So in fact, this is essentially a full logical answer to Bull's problem. 
Um, so what, we, what I mean by an empirical model is exactly the situation we saw before. We have this family of basic events, this family of propositions in those events, and uh, we want to bound what the, uh, the possible values of the probabilities can be. And any such inequality that is satisfied um, is equivalent to one of these inequalities. So this gives an answer, and I mean, Pritovsky didn't give an answer of this kind. I mean, he had a brute force method and he made the connection with uh, Bell inequalities, which we'll just say a little bit about in a moment, but he did sort of envisage such a thing. He says, all facet inequalities for these, what he called correlation polytopes should follow from Venn diagrams. That is the possible relations among N events in a probability space. In other words, the key point is, although our end result is about probabilities, what's controlling what's happening is the logical structure, the, the consistency relations among the events. So this is a beautiful connection between logic and probability. And um, the remarkable thing we have now since Bell and now really in happening uh, in the emerging uh, quantum computing uh, industry is uh, quantum conditions of impossible experience. So let me say a little bit about that. Um, so I'll, uh, we, let, let's make it something very concrete and very meaningful in computer science terms. So we'll talk about a certain kind of game. So what's often called a non-local game. Uh, so we have Alice and Bob, who are two agents who are trying to cooperate on a game, but they're, they're not allowed to communicate with each other while we're, there, we're playing the games. So they're put in different rooms, their mobile phones we take away, they're put in Faraday cages, they can't communicate with each other. Or if we're really at the found fundamental physics level, we'll arrange for them to be space-like separated so there's no time for light to travel between them to carry any information in the, in the time that we're playing around with the game. But anyway, we just think of it in this uh, fashion. And there's a verifier who provides inputs to Alice and Bob and they have to respond with uh, answers. So in particular, we can look at this XOR game where the inputs are binary and the outputs are binary. And the winning condition is this odd looking thing that the XOR of the outputs have to uh, be equal to the conjunction of the inputs. These are all Boolean values, so this makes sense. If you think about it, um, there are three cases where the conjunction is false. And in those cases, we're saying that um, this XOR has to be false which is to say that A and B must have the same value. So they're correlated, either both zero or both one. And in the final case where X and Y is true, X is one and Y is one, then this has to be true, meaning that A and B have to be anti-correlated. So the, the, the winning cases are when are these first three cases where, where the X and Y are uh, false and where we get correlated values for the outcomes together with the final case where X and Y are both one and the outputs have to be anti-correlated. And here we're just averaging over these probabilities. So imagine we have some probabilistic strategy, which is um, assigning probability weights to each response that we can have. And here is a tabulation of such a strategy, uh, which says, for example, that is such that if the verifier sends Alice zero and Bob one, then with probability one eight, Alice outputs are zero and Bob outputs are one and so on. And if you just think about it, the winning conditions are down the first column on the first three rows and also the last column. Uh, and in the middle, the anti-correlated outcomes on the fourth row. So if we sum all of that, then you see we get one on the first row, six eights, six eights, and then six eights here. So we get three and 3.25 and, um, uh, if we average out with a uniform distribution on the input, we get this winning probability. So we could look at these numbers, they might leave us cold, well, what does it mean? But the fact is that in the classical world, using classical logic and probability and classical physics, the optimal classical probability is three quarters. Um, we, we can get three quarters quite easily with a dumb strategy, for example, Alice and Bob could agree to both always output a zero, whatever their, their input is, very easy. But if they agree that beforehand, then you see in the first three cases they win, but in the fourth case, they inevitably lose. 
So even if they have probability one down this column, then the, what they're doing is three quarters. More pro so that's a dumb strategy, which gets us to three quarters success probability. More profoundly, however clever we try to be using shared randomness, um, any kind of devious coordinated strategy we bring into the game, the best we can do, the hard barrier classically, is this three quarters. And the proof of this is the same as Bell inequalities, which is exactly the bool conditions of possible experience, um, of possible experience. And the moral is that since the Bell table exceeds the bound, and it is quantum realizable, it shows that quantum resources yield a quantum advantage in an information processing task. So let's just apply our derivation of the bool um, uh, condition to our table that we just showed here, this quantum realizable table, uh, where I've highlighted the winning, uh, the winning events, uh, correlated in the first three rows, anti-correlated in the last. So we look at the propositions that correspond to those events row by row. So correlated is the same as that the variables are uh, logically equivalent. Those are the truth conditions and XOR on the final row. And it's easy enough to see. So we can replace A2 by B1, B1 by A1, A1 by B2, and we end up with B2 exclusive or B2, which is obviously unsatisfiable. So the conditions from our derivation apply and we see that the maximum weight of the probabilities under our little theorem is uh, three, four propositions, it has to be n minus one, it has to be three. And we've, uh, we, we've got, uh, we've gone, we've exceeded that, we violated this logical inequality. Uh, you, may, you may think that this is, there's something fishy here. Well, there, there's nothing fishy, but there is an assumption that we made in deriving our uh, inequality over here which is that there is a joint distribution from which all the observable probabilities arise as marginals. Under that assumption, everything here is impeccable reasoning. You may like to think exactly where in this formal derivation that assumption was implicitly being made. Um, it's a nice thing to think about, but it was being made at just one step. So we have to remove that assumption um, if uh, um, in, in uh, in, in thinking about quantum systems which violate this bound. Uh, whatever's happening there, it can't be that there's this global picture with a joint distribution on all the variables, whether we choose to measure them or not. What we have is a collection of windows where, where we measure certain variables, but not others. That's all locally consistent, but it does not patch together into a joint distribution. Okay, so um, is this science fiction? Well, no, it's science fact. So the first generally accepted loophole-free Bell tests showing exactly this phenomenon of violation for essentially exactly this, uh, the, the, the sort of game that we, we, we presented. Uh, the, the game, if you think of it in physics language, is instead of Alice and Bob, we have sort of uh, uh, experimenters or, or stations in an experiment Instead of the verifiers inputs, we have measurement settings. And instead of responses by Alice and Bob, we have uh, observed outcomes of uh, measurements, which are collected somewhere. Here's, here's John Bell, who we're now arguing is a pioneer of, of uh, computer science and his work is, does have a strong logical form. And here is a schematic for that kind of experiment, a source of entangled qubits that are sent off to Alice and Bob. Measurements are performed and the outputs are collected here. And we look at these the cor correlations as coincidences. And this is a review of this, uh, these work by Alan Asper, who led the first attempts at experimental tests of, uh, in, uh, back in the 1980s. So it took three decades of uh, also of um, uh, refinement of uh, technology, photon detectors and so on before uh, loophole free tests could be constructed. So that is our second vignette. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I sh if anyone wants to ask any questions. I believe this can be there, done through. Hi, Samson. There's one question. Um, okay. If this is a good moment to uh, to answer. It's it's already from the previous vignette. Oh right. Yes. I'm sorry. I should have stopped before. No, no, no. Uh, the question came in came in a little a little later. But I think if if you're okay, then I will read out this question. Please do. Yes. 
So um, Simon Gay asks the following, how should computer scientists bridge the gap between the kind of beautiful theory that Samson has outlined and the complexity of practical computation and modern programming languages, which have often evolved without much attention to logical principles? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think that could be a good item to take up in the discussion afterwards, because we could obviously spend a lot of time talking about that. Okay, um, that might I mean, I, I, let me just say very briefly that I think there are two approaches which have been taken to this. One is to um, uh, try and make theory that applies directly to the ugly reality. The other is to try and replace the ugly reality by a somewhat more beautiful reality. Um, for example, having elegant, more elegant programming languages. And I suppose we need some of both, but I guess probably we can, we can this could be a nice thing to come up for the, for the panel and the general discussion. I'll keep, I'll keep it open for the panel. Right, great. Okay, are there any other uh, questions if anyone wants to nip so in? So far this? in the Q&A and chat, this is the only question. So okay, well, in that case, I guess I'll continue to my final uh, vignette before concluding, and that's about the logic of contextuality. So Bull also figures in this, but we've already seen him a couple of times. So here I show Simon Cochin uh, um, and Ernst Becker, both logicians by, again by, by their sort of uh, day job with uh, many um, uh, notable, uh, famous contributions, but also and maybe their most famous work was this work which used logical ideas again in the foundations of quantum mechanics, what's known as the Koch and Specker theorem from the, from the mid 1960s, actually also called the Bell Koch and Specker theorem because Bell had a, um, a related result at, a, at about the same time in the mid 1960s. Uh, I think the form that um, Koch and Specker's work took was particular had a particular uh, beauty and um, uh, made the connection with logic uh, very clear. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Simon Cochin at a meeting kind of to celebrate this, uh, the, um, I guess, uh, 50th uh, anniversary of their, their famous paper from uh, 1967, uh, a few years ago. Um, well, um, so the, again, I'll, I'll be talking about a paper with uh, Rui Barbosa. Um, so I'll, I'll be able to tell Rui that I've shown a picture of him on, on the same page as uh, with uh, Cochin and, and, and Specker. Uh, and that, that's going to appear in uh, CSL in, I guess, a couple of, a couple of weeks time or something like that, about the logic of contextuality. Rui is in the audience. So he can and Rui is in the audience, yes. Yeah, so Rui, uh, you're, uh, you're on. <laughs> okay. So the... Uh, so the key foundational question in quantum computation is to characterize those information tasks. Well, yes, I, to me, the key foundational question is to characterize those information tasks where there is provable quantum advantage. So the task can be performed provably better using quantum resources than with purely classical resources. And of course, this, you know, what that's going to come out of, I mean, anyway, the usual um, uh, sort of electronics that we use in classical computation is itself founded on quantum mechanics, but uh, it's used to build an excellent simulation of classical Boolean logic and all the rest of it. So if there's going to be something more, then it has to come out of the non-classical aspects of quantum theory. And in particular, this brings contextuality into the picture. So the strange phenomena of non-locality that we just saw before in our discussion of Bell and Boole is more generally um, understood in terms of this idea of contextuality. So it's a key signature of non-classicality, non-locality is a special case. And this phenomenon is highly implicated in many, possibly all cases of quantum advantage. And my favorite slogan is that contextuality arises where there's a family of data which is locally consistent, but globally inconsistent. And of course, for computer scientists, this is, I mean, if we think of constraint, satisfaction, and so on, then um, uh, many other paradigms, then uh, we, we can have feeling for this definition. And indeed, 
these notions do arise in classical computer science, in, in constraint satisfaction, in database theory, uh, and in many other places. I've worked with Manoush on connections with uh, linguistics, computational linguistics, for example. Okay, so the formalism which Cochin and Specker introduced is that of partial Boolean algebra. So we're going directly from Boole in the mid 19th century to um, what you might think of as a small or, or um, odd uh, generalization, which turns out to have profound consequences. So we know what Boolean algebras are. We even tend to think that certainly unless we go into sort of higher set theory questions, Boolean algebra is fairly trivial. After all, finite Boolean algebras are just power sets and so on and so forth. I mean, countable Boolean algebra is the propositional calculus, essentially. Um, you know, even apart from the fact that that is not true, I mean, just think about P versus NP, um, uh, partial Boolean algebras are really, uh, I mean, they're, they're an apparently anodyne generalization, but they have some remarkable features. So a partial Boolean algebra, so we have a set, we have constant zero, one, we have a binary relation, which is part of the signature, which we think of as co-measurability. And the essential point, you know, we've already seen with the Bell example is that we can't measure all the variables at the same time. So there was no global distribution on all the variables. We can measure certain things or observe them at the same time, but the ones that weren't measured, we can't really say anything about their values. So to delineate this explicitly, we have this co-measurability or compatibility relation. We have a unary, we have negation, which is total, but we restrict conjunction and disjunction to be partial, uh, partial operations whose domain is exactly this uh, compatibility relation. This is, by the way, a very a crucially different uh, approach to that taken by Birkhoff and von Neumann in their quantum logic. They took conjunction in particular as a total operation, and that's not really physically meaningful. And it, Quantum logic goes in strange directions, and in the end, one can argue, has not served well as a basis for quantum computing. So anyway, these, the, what, 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 what must this data satisfy? Every set of pairwise commensurable elements can be a sort of um, contained in a larger set of pairwise commensurable elements, which forms a total Boolean algebra under the restrictions of the given operations. It can be put in more elementary terms, but that's the simplest way of stating it. And in general, for now, whenever I just say Boolean algebra, I mean total Boolean algebra. And of course, the absolutely key example from Cochin and Specker's point of view is given by the projectors on a Hilbert space. So projectors are just operators on the Hilbert space, which are idempotent and self-adjoint. If we think of a finite dimensional Hilbert space, these are just square complex matrices which are idempotent, so multiplying A by itself gives you, um, gives you A, and self-adjoint, meaning that the conjugate transpose is the same. The matrix is invariant under conjugate transpose. And the operation of conjunction, which is just the product the, 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 uh, of multiplying projectors, becomes a partial one, only defined on commuting projectors. It's easy to check that if two projectors commute, then um, their, their, comp their, their compositional product is again a projector, but otherwise not. Morphisms of partial Boolean algebras are maps preserving commensurability in the operations wherever defined. This gives a category uh, PBA. Um, Cochin and Specker showed in their seminal paper that contextuality is inherent in quantum mechanics, even in finite dimension, as soon as we get to dimension three and above, and moreover can be formulated in logical terms using this notion of partial Boolean algebra. So the original formulation was there's, the, the, there's no embedding of the partial Boolean algebras of projectors into a total Boolean algebra as soon as the domain of the, of the underlying space is at least three. So you might, I mean, you, you might say that, a, you might think, wonder if a partial algebra is kind of not really serious about being partial because if you were asked to, you could extend it to a total one and then you'd just be in the usual Boolean world. But in fact, there could be obstructions to extending a partial algebra to a total one. And this happens in our key example as in almost all cases. In fact, they considered a hierarchy of increasingly weaker forms of non-contextuality. 
um, and hence whose negations form increasingly stronger forms of contextuality for a partial Boolean algebra. A can be embedded in a Boolean algebra. There's a homomorphism into some Boolean algebra whose restriction to each Boolean subalgebra is an embedding. And there's, a homomorph there's just some homomorphism into some total Boolean algebra. That's the, the, the weakest ask. And therefore, if we, if we can't even have that, that's the strongest form of contextuality. So um, the first condition is, I mean, if we remember a couple of facts about Boolean algebras, any Boolean algebra has a homomorphism into the two element Boolean algebra. In fact, it has a lot of them, enough to separate elements. This is another version of the completeness theorem as we were mentioning earlier. So the first condition is equivalent to there are enough homomorphisms into the two element Boolean algebra to separate elements of A. And the third is equivalent simply to there is some homomorphism from this partial Boolean algebra into the two element Boolean algebra. Remember, these two valued homomorphisms are exactly the ultra filters, the points of a stone space in the case of an ordinary Boolean algebra. So this is the strongest contextuality. So its negation gives us the strongest contextuality property. There is not even one homomorphism from A into two. And again, this is saying there's no global way of assigning truth values to all the propositions um, in this, uh, which preserves all the operations. And this is what Cochin and Specker prove. And we call this the Cochin and Specker property, the KS property of a partial Boolean algebra. So we mentioned conditions of impossible experience. And here is, I think, the nicest statement of that, which appears in this Cochin and Specker paper. If you have a partial Boolean algebra, then the following are equivalent. A is Koch and Specker, and there is a propositional contradiction in ordinary classical propositional logic, um, a, a pro so in, in some variables, and an assignment of elements of the partial Boolean algebra to the variables in, the, in this formula, which is a propositional uh, con con um, contradiction. Uh, such that the formula is well defined in the partial Boolean algebra. Everything that is that needs to be compatible is so we can evaluate the whole formula um, in that in, in under that interpretation in the partial Boolean algebra A, and that formula is true. So that's what I mean by um, you know realizing a contradiction. And of course, this is telling us in a very strong form that the event algebra of quantum mechanics is going to be interpreted globally in a consistent fashion. Our local observations, real observations of real measurements, cannot be pieced together globally by reference to a single underlying objective reality. The values that they reveal are inherently contextual. They depend on the particular set of variables we were measuring in that uh, measurement event. And at the philosophical level or the foundational level, we can ask how could the world be this way? And I think it's fair to say there's still an ongoing debate and an enduring mystery. Well, um, so now let's put this in a more modern language. Coach and Specker did not use any category theory um, in, in um, a very nice paper by Chris Hernan and Benno van der Berg from a few years back. Um, they show that every partial Boolean algebra is the co-limit of its Boolean subalgebras. Co-products have a simple direct description. In fact, co-products of partial Boolean algebras are much simpler than co-products of total Boolean algebras. You simply form the disjoint union, but merely identifying the zero and one elements, the gluing together the top and bottom elements, and nothing else. If you think about total Boolean algebras, all the operations have to be total. So actually there's a lot of combining of things coming from A and from B to form the, to form the co-product in the, in the ordinary category of total Boolean algebras. Okay, so that's co-products, they're nice and simple. But on the other hand, co-equalizers and general co-limits are actually shown in that paper by Chris and Benno to exist by an appeal to the adjoint functor theorem. And one of the things we did in our paper is to give an explicit construction of the needed co-limits. And this does make actually quite a big difference and turns out to give a very useful, there are many variations we can play on this and we make many uses of this. So here's the result or, or the way or the more general statement, which generates from a given partial Boolean algebra, a new one, 
where prescribed additional commensurability relations are enforced between its elements. So if you're given a partial Boolean algebra A and an arbitrary binary relation on A, uh, which need bear no relationship to anything in the Boolean algebra structure on A, there's a partial Boolean algebra we write like this, in, into which the, um, we can map the original partial Boolean algebra and such that um, whenever two elements were in this relation that we gave, they actually become commensurable in this extended algebra, and which moreover has the appropriate universal property um, that, that whenever you have a partial a PBA homomorphism into some B which satisfies this, then uh, it factors through this embedding of A into this extension of A uh, in, in a unique fashion. And the result is proved constructively by, or particularly existence of this thing, by giving proof rules for commensurability and equivalence relations over a set of syntactic terms generated from A. Uh, so this is a nice application of a kind of different bit of logic. Now I'll show you the rules, but in the spirit of the present talk, I won't go through them. I mean, they, they follow in a very natural way from you know, the various considerations, but this is what we do. We basically throw all these things, the operations, definedness, compatibility into a single inductive definition. Um, and we have a variation where we can also force additional uh, equations. And this is what gives us uh, an explicit construction of co-equalizers and hence of general and covariance. Sen sorry, can I interrupt you with one yes. question? And then uh, I also want to point out we should be wrapping to wrapping up to move to the panel. Yes. Um, so one question from Andy Pitts. Connecting vignettes one and three, is there any useful form of stone duality for partial Boolean algebras? That is a very interesting question, and it's something that Rui and I are thinking about at the moment, because we actually are trying to prove a nice duality theorem, which would be a kind of generalization of a basic version of stone duality. And we're, um, we're, um, we haven't quite worked it out, but we think, so basically there's a very simple version of stone duality between finite sets and finite Boolean algebras, special case of the stone theorem. We would like to do a, a corresponding version between uh, say reflexive graphs and um, a certain category of uh, um, partial Boolean algebras of a finite character, which would include all the things that arise as P of H's for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And we're actually, we haven't quite worked out the story on the maps yet, but I think we're, we're getting there. So yes, good question. And uh, I hope there's a positive answer that we will have soon. Anything else? No, that that's it for now. Okay, I'll I'll continue. I I am um, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll try and uh, okay. Let let me just say a little bit more, and then I'll then I'll wrap up. So um, let me just point out that what I've told you might might seem not to quite make sense. Uh, we know that partial that Boolean algebras are a full subcategory of PBA, and we we you know from this nice result, uh, van der Berg that A is the co-limit in PBA of its Boolean subalgebras. Now, also the category of Boolean algebra certainly has co-limits. So let B be the co-limit of the same diagram and the inclusions between them. Then the cone from D to B is also a cone in PBA. Hence, by the universal property we just said, there must be a mediating morphism from A to B. So how does this um, live with the, uh, live with the um, Koch and Specker property? So answers, please. <laughs> Um, in fact, I mean, the, the, to resolve the contradiction, we're thinking of Boolean algebras as an equational variety of algebras over set. And as such, it's complete and co-complete, but it also then inevitably admits the one element algebra in which zero equals one, as it were, the Lindenbaum algebra of, a, of any inconsistent theory. And of course, one does not have a homomorphism to two. So uh, what that's telling us is that a PBA with a Koch and Specker property of not having a homomorphism to two, the co-limit in BA of its diagram of Boolean subalgebras must be one. So you see now that the force of the partiality is it's holding these potentially contradictory elements 
I mean, together, but not really allowing them to sort of uh, annihilate each other because of the partiality. So we can never, although we, um, yeah. Uh, and in fact, this becomes then a little theorem that it's equivalent to have the Koch and Specker property and for the, the co-limit of the diagram of Boolean subalgebras in the category of Boolean algebras is one. And in fact, we could formulate the Koch and Specker property directly for diagrams to Boolean algebras, um, which sort of connects this with the, the sort of uh, Isham Butterfield type of uh, approach, I suppose, uh, Topos approach, as it's sometimes called. Okay, so the diagram is implicitly contradictory. And when you actually force the issue by taking the co-limit, you obtain the manifestly contradictory one. Uh, but notice that very non-trivial and essential structures, such as P of H projectors, hold this implicitly contradictory information together in a single structure in a way that's just as consistent as we need to account for all the experimental data arising from our most successful physical theory. Okay, I'm now going field and I should maybe, well, I'll skip over that, but I do want to say a little bit about tensor products because this is a nice point. Um, the Koch and Specker property arises when dim of H is greater than or equal to three. It's actually easy to give a very, uh, well, a, a large but simple description of the projectors on two dimensional Hilbert space, just C2. Um, if you think about the two, I mean, as soon as you give a one vector, there's a, it has a unique orthogonal. Um, so uh, what you get is actually a large number of copies of four element Boolean algebras. In fact, a co-product of uncountably many copies of the four element Boolean algebra. That is what P of C2 is. So it's big, but simple. And there's no interaction between these different bases. The bases can't really overlap. One of the key points at which non-classicality emerges in quantum theory is the passage from P of C2 to P of C4. I mean, already to P of C3, but the interesting thing is that P of C4 is the tensor product of two copies of C2 and C2. C2 is a space of qubits. C2 tensor C2 is when you go up to two qubits, which is actually where we were with Bell's theorem. So the question is, can we capture the Hilbert space tensor product in logical form? Uh, is there a monoidal structure on the category PBA such that the functor from Hilbert spaces to partial Boolean algebras is strong monoidal with respect to this structure? Um, and that would be a rather powerful thing. It would offer a complete logical characterization of the Hilbert space tensor product and provide an important step towards giving logical foundations for quantum theory in a form useful for quantum information and computation. So I think this is a really interesting question and uh, Rui and I are thinking about this. So I'll just, I just want to uh, mention this I mean, I mentioned that, you know, we may think that finite Boolean algebras certainly are trivial and maybe more generally, unless we go to large cardinalities, Boolean algebras aren't very interesting, but, but, but partial Boolean algebras could be remarkably different to um, uh, ordinary Boolean algebras. It's a standard fact that in any Boolean algebra, every finitely generated subalgebra is finite. Essentially, you have distributive normal forms, uh, disjunctive normal forms, I should say, or conjunctive normal forms. And so you get finitely many expressions up to logical equivalence. But here's a remarkable result by Conway and Cochin. This is John Conway um, and Simon Cochin, who showed um, the following, that in P of C4, exactly this thing where this on classicality emerges, as we were saying, there's a set of five projectors, local Paulis, which generate a uniformly dense infinite subalgebra of the whole of P of C4. Uh, quite a remarkable, and they use a lot of very elaborate geometry and algebra to show this. And I'd love to have a logical proof of this. So another thing we would like to think about. So to wrap up, where will logic go next on its journeys? And as I guess we're going to discuss how will it withstand the challenges of noise and unpredictability and the apparently inexorable rise of machine learning and big data, uh, which has generated an attitude which I've encountered on occasion, uh, which could be summarized crudely as we don't need no stinking logic, uh, as it were. Uh, anyway, my answer is it's up to us. We got to make our road in which I, logic, as I think it can and should, continues to play a major role 
in our discipline. So uh, I'll finish there. Thanks, Samson. That was. I'll so I stop the stop sharing. Yeah, that's that's great, and we can get all the panelists to maybe share their video so that we can open up the panel session. So I so there's the open question by Simon, which we can come back to uh, later on, um, and I will pass on to Mernush, who will uh, chair the panel. Thank you very much, Samson. Okay. Um, am I not muted now? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. So we are going to have our panel discussion now. Each panelist is going to talk about five minutes about their views on the following topics of discussion. So one is basically the last question Samson put up. Um, the world is noisy and uncertain. Has logic had its day? So it's a question Samson want the panelists to answer. And the second one is, we just want to know about each panelist's personal journey into the world of logic, their experiences with logic. Um, so each panelist is gonna five, uh, talk about five minutes. Um, then we'll have a Q&A for about half an hour, 20 minutes. And then remember to use the Q&A option for this, not the chat option. And I'll just quickly go through the order of presentation of the panel, which is alphabetical. So the first person is Professor Robin Hirsch from PPLV UCL. Then we have Dr. Nathan Kleindins from Linguistics in UCL. Dr. Pasquale Minervi from the AI Center in UCL. Then Dr. Lavinia Piccolo from Philosophy, National University of Singapore and UCL. And then Professor Alexandra Russo from Symbolic Reasoning, Imperial College. So on to you, Robin. Okay, I'll unmute. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you ever so much for inviting me uh, onto the panel. Um, and I did want to talk about uh, a journey through logic. Uh, I'm going to mention just two characters on this journey. Uh, I want to check that I can share a screen. Can you see that? Hope so. Um, very good. Okay, so the first character um, on this journey is Peter Abelard, who was a famous logician from the early 12th century. Uh, and he became famous afterwards, largely because of his love affair with Eloise. Um, and we see a, a, a painting of them probably in the gardens of Notre Dame in Paris. Uh, and she was a scholar in her own right, uh, 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 some kind of early feminist who railed against marriage, which she thought of as bondage, but um, they collaborated. Uh, she wrote, as oft his hand upon my breast would fall as twould upon the page. And you can picture that perhaps, um, it's surprising that they managed to get work done, but you can see why this is um, exciting because Abelard was amongst the first to introduce Aristotle and to read it and to, and, and to propose it widely. He had many, many followers. Um, and the key question he was looking at um, amongst others was the nation of the Trinity. Um, God, one and indivisible, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. And he approached this uh, using the law of identity, which you may know X equals X. Um, but he separated different types of um, identity. Uh, there was what he called essential identity, uh, when things are essentially the same, and there was identity by having the same properties, uh, a couple of other types of identity. And on the basis of this, he tried to look at the scriptures, look at the gospels, observe the contradictions or apparent contradictions and try to resolve them as a rational way of justifying the truth of the Trinity. Uh, you can think of this as almost a formal proof that one equals three. Um, in doing so, I mean, maybe I can move to my next slide actually, because not so easy. Yeah. Here are some of the questions he considered, by the way. 
Um, and to each of these questions, based on the Gospels, he was able to come with a yes and with a no answer. And his method was to try to resolve, he wasn't attacking the scriptures, he was trying to find the truth, but he, he believed that you needed logic that faith, in answer to the first question listed here, that faith wasn't enough. Um, in fact, you needed logic in order to get to the truth. Um, and he developed a, a logic of propositions. He had a clear idea of entailment. Uh, he had a truth functional definition of negation. It's all there. Um, he also tried to develop uh, a logic of relations binary relations, higher order relations, but was less successful. And you have to wait more than seven centuries until um, Augustus to Morgan here at UCL, um, I think was perhaps the first to really understand that properties of relations could not be reduced to properties of the individual parts that you, cannot express or reason about binary relations using only unary ones. Um, and that was a breakthrough. And that's been uh, actually the fundamental part of my own research is to look at these properties of binary relations, which I think um, have many interests which go beyond what you can do um, in Boolean algebra or with purely unary properties. Um, now look, the second I don't have much time, but very briefly, the second um, part of the journey. Um, here we see a picture of Einstein with Gödel at Princeton. They were good friends. Um, they studied each other's work. Um, since we were talking about God, I mean, I have to say, I have to say I'm an atheist, but I find this way of reasoning from unfamiliar, with unfamiliar terms and mysterious objects and trying to derive a truth from it, I find it fascinating. So Gödel also, um, by the way, um, didn't prove the Trinity, but he, he has a claim proof of the existence of God based on an argument of Anselm, uh, but put in modern modal logic, in symbols I've written it underneath, he has a claimed proof that it's necessary that there exists a God, um, but I didn't really want to talk about that. Um, this, he worked, for example, on the Einstein field equations and solved them with a particular solution called a rotating universe model. Um, but this interaction between relativity theory, which is another field where rather strange, mysterious things happen like length, contraction, black holes, and what have you, and try to reason about it logically. Um, this has been continued by the Hungarian school more recently in Budapest. Um, and they try to, to apply logic to solve these problems. And you get some interesting results for computation. If you look at the timelines of people who cross into uh, over the threshold of a black hole, you can actually solve the halting problem. Um, or so it seems, uh, and, and therefore um, it's a, a consequence of that is that the church Turing thesis is probably false in our world. Now I, I need to wrap up because um, time is limited. I'm going to finish on a thoroughly rhetorical note. Um, and if you are going to accuse me of jumping on a bandwagon, you'd be absolutely correct. But I'm going to give a definition, a, a new definition of logic, um, which I'm going to phrase as a negative definition. And I know that mostly we prefer positive definitions, but this is different. Um, I'm defining logic as the exact negation of Trumpism. And uh, what I mean by that is, first of all, that according to Trump, there's a complete contempt for logic and indeed any type of scholarship, but also a denial of any type of truth which is separate from assertiveness. Whereas in logic, um, in logic, we have an obsessive attention to the detail of an argument and the methods in which you get 
from what you're given to what you're trying to demonstrate. Um, and the aim of logic is to demonstrate and justify a type of truth which, which lasts longer than uh, current fashions do. So that in my most optimistic moments, I think that logical thinking is a prerequisite for a more logical way of doing things um, and therefore that the defense of logic is a central part of the defense of science. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to Manoush. I hope I, I don't think I've overrun, uh, but uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Robin. That was great. Thank you. So we take questions at the end. So now we go to Nathan Kleindins, please. Hi, Nathan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me just try to share some slides. Sorry. Um, um, uh, uh -huh. I had a fear that I was going to run into a problem, uh, but I think I can solve it. So, uh, sorry, I, I'm having a bit of trouble to share my slides. Would, could, could I maybe work that out and, and re change the order up? Um, would that be okay? Sure, I think we can go to uh, Pasquale then. Pasquale Minervi. Hi, Hi everyone. Hello. 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 How are you? Hello. So let me quickly share the screen. Uh, one sec. Uh, uh, are you, can you see my, my screen? I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it the one with the slides? No, it's the one with the browser. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just one sec. Um, okay, now this should be it, I hope. Uh, can you see the right screen right now? And yeah, awesome. Thanks. Um, so hi, I'm, I'm Pasquale. Um, I'm in UCL since four years now, and um, uh, this is a brief overview of some of the work that we are doing on addressing uh, some of the limitations of modern deep learning methods by using logic. And this is not just me, but it's um, um, it's it's a group of people from the UCL AI Center plus um, some collaborators that we are working with like, towards this common goal. So okay, this figure, in my opinion, pretty much sums the state of deep learning at the moment. So there's the person of the on the left that asks, "Is this your machine learning system?" And the other says, um, "Yeah, you just." put the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then you collect the answers. And then what if the answers are wrong? And the other person, ah, you just steer the pile until they start looking right. And this is pretty much what's happening right now in machine learning and deep learning. And it, um, it wants to convey the message that we don't really know what's going on in modern deep learning systems. We train a sequence of nonlinear transformations that we hope we will be able to produce some useful predictions, but we don't know whether this will happen. And don't, we don't really understand uh, what kind of reasoning is going on in, in those models. So going a bit more into details, uh, deep learning suffers from three, in my opinion, um, critical issues. One is um, data inefficiency. That is, modern deep learning models require large volumes of training data in order to be um, effective. Um, for example, deep learning uh, times deep learning's time to shine in computer vision came with the appearance of ImageNet, a dataset with around 1.3 million images labeled with hundreds of categories that deep learning um, computer vision models can use as training data. 
However, in the real world, we don't necessarily have millions and millions of training examples for a given task because um, annotating examples can be extremely complex and expensive. For example, think of recognizing some rare uh, lung diseases from chest X-rays. For those, um, 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 for many of those real world tasks, we, we are forced to work in a, in a um, uh, loaded regime. Then after we manage to train a model, it can still fail um, if we evaluate it on examples that come from a different distribution than the training data. For example, consider, can you see my cursor? Maybe not, maybe yes. Uh, we can see, I can see a panda slide. Um, one sec, I just realized you can also see, you can see your picture. That's not too, supposed to happen, but now it's better. Okay, so um, consider the panda image on the left. We can design a noise mask that is invisible to humans, and then we just impose the, the mask over the panda. And then we, we get the picture of, on the right, which looks exactly the same um, as the picture on the left, um, because there are some um, invisible to humans perturbations. But now the deep learning system will recognize the image on the right as a gibbon for some reason. And, sim and there's something similar happening for the um, uh, image of the vulture on, on, uh, here on the left. We can identify a rotation of the image such that the model will stop recognizing the vulture and will somehow detect an orangutan instead. And now think of the real world consequences that of, of what we just saw. If we are working on a, let's say on a self-driving car, can we really guarantee that it will always recognize that um, stop signals correctly? And for this particular use case, um, there are some experiments uh, showing that if you attach some, a few small um, stickers to a road signal, let's say to a stop signal, um, it will still be a road signal for other humans, but now we'll, the, um, the deep learning model will start recognizing that that's something else, in this case, on a road signal saying that the speed limit is, is now uh, 45 uh, kilometers per hour. And I believe that if we want to deploy um, deep learning um, models as they are for critical decision making tasks, we can have really catastrophic consequences. And finally, after we manage to train somehow a deep learning model to do some task, we usually get a black box. Um, the computations carried out by the layers in this model do not necessarily correspond to something that, that humans can comprehend. And also, so basically a deep learning model takes some input and then transforms that in, um, um, each layer produces a transformation of the input, but then this transformation doesn't really have a humanly comprehensible semantics. So can we solve those issues? And we know that um, symbolic AI systems um, tend not to suffer to, to, uh, from these limitations. And for example, Professor Alessandro Russo can tell you how a system that learns a model defined in, term, in terms of, let's say, a logic program can be robust, efficient, and interpretable. And in our research, we are working on uh, using logic to address the lim those limitations in deep learning models. And so far, we identified two main strategies of doing so. In one strategy, um, uh, we can use, um, we basically, we work on using logic for improving the training of, um, of a machine learning model. So during the train, do, during the training phase of the model, we can dynamically encourage the model to be consistent with a set of predefined logic constraints. And one way to do so is by, uh, we call it adversarial training. We have another agent that tries to find where the model violates some, um, um, some logical constraints. And then if, uh, if this agent finds some inconsistent in inconsistencies, some logical inconsistencies in the model predictions, we train the model to fix those inconsistencies. And this kind of zero sum game goes on and on during training. And this way we can incorporate uh, pre-existing background knowledge in, in terms of um, logical constraints into, um, deep learn into the, a downstream deep learning model without having uh, the model to learn those constraints and this background knowledge from scratch every time. 
And another way we can combine uh, logic and deep learning models, so symbolic and subsymbolic um, components, is by integrating a, a logic reasoning component inside of a larger neural network. And then the neural part of the model can learn how to use the reasoning component in, in order to accomplish its tasks. So for example, the neural component of the model can be used for detecting what is, what's in the input, let's say objects and the relationships between them. And then uh, those relationships, uh, those atoms, those logical atoms, because th that's what they are in some sense, can be fed into the logical reasoning component that can uh, be used for drawing some logical conclusions about the input and also provide explanations for in, in terms of intermediate reasoning steps. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we, had, we found some technical issues. Uh, for instance, the logical component assumes that the input uh, um, is discrete, is, is symbolic, while the neural component needs to work with the continuous representations. And what we did to solve these problems is to develop um, a generalization of um, the backward chaining and reasoning algorithm. Um, um, that is able to work with continuous representations of logic symbols rather than just discrete representations. And so uh, how much time do I have left? Because uh, I have a, a cool demo I would like to show you. I skipped this slide, but I think it's interesting. Um, as, as an application of this, um, um, and this enables us to do um, to to use let's say logic reasoning on other modalities that are not that not, not sorry uh, logic atoms but also let's say text. So for example, um, we can um, um, consider entity. We can we can take a corpus of documents. We can consider the uh, entities in um, um, in in, the, in in a document as logical terms, and then we can we can consider the text connecting to entities as a logical relationship. And this relaxation of the backward chaining algorithm enables us to, for example, do um, multi op reasoning over text and also provide explanations to the users in terms of uh, um, the inter intermediate reasoning steps that the model took in order to give an answer to a query. And that's it. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, Thank you. Very interesting. Hopefully, there will be time. Okay, I'm sharing now. Um, You're not sharing anymore. Okay, thanks. Ah, okay, <laughs> so I didn't. I wasn't sharing this last slide. Okay, sorry. I was. Okay, no, never mind. I don't worry. Uh, I thought I was sharing, but then you should this move. Was the... you should move. Um, are Are you ready now, Nathan? Yes, I believe so. I believe so. Sorry for that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll try once again to. Uh, Share my slides. Okay, there we are. Uh, so yeah, I'm Nathan Clendens. I'm a lecturer in the linguistics department. I work on uh, semantics of um, human languages. Uh, so I started out with a quote uh, from Richard Montague, uh, who is a kind of uh, pioneer for the field that I work in. Um, and I just want to briefly kind of give you a sense of uh, what I do, uh, I've pitched the discussion uh, perhaps a bit mistakenly towards students, um, but uh, it hopefully will be of interest to all of you. Uh, so in giving you a sense of what I do, I also want to talk about some uh, puzzles of logic, since I suppose that's what probably got many of us uh, interested in the areas we work in uh, to begin with. Uh, so uh, linguistics, at least in, in the sense in which I do linguistics, is about trying to explain the human capacity for language. And that means kind of at its core, understanding the rules of languages, uh, how they're acquired, uh, how they do and don't vary. Uh, so what do languages have in common? What's a possible human language? And uh, as kind of a part and parcel of this is understanding the cognitive mechanisms that allow us to use, use the rules of language to uh, in speaking and understanding. So linguistic semantics, uh, is the subdiscipline of this uh, project that's concerned with uh, the meanings of words and how syntactic structure kind of correspondingly builds meaning. So linguistic semantics is just semantics uh, as you know it uh, from logic, but um, applied to human languages. 
And uh, indeed, the project of doing this was born from, from logic, from uh, model theory. Uh, so in the 60s, as uh, modern linguistics emerged kind of through the work of Chomsky, uh, part of this was a kind of cognitive turn, but another aspect of it was uh, an increased kind of formal rigor. And uh, the philosopher Richard Montague uh, kind of took up this project on the meaning side, uh, where early linguists were actually a bit uh, slow or skeptical and essentially applied tools from, from model theory and intentional logic, uh, tools from Tarski, Church, and Carnap uh, to systematically study the semantics of natural languages or human languages. And although, as you may know, his work was cut short by his uh, untimely death, uh, it was hugely in influential at UCLA, uh, where I uh, studied, uh, and of course beyond, and, and is kind of the basis for the field in which I work today. So uh, logic, of course, has always been concerned with language insofar as we um, reason uh, with language or, or anyway uh, talk about how we reason with language. Um, and so as, as of course you know, in uh, early logicians were often interested in the ways in which kind of language, uh, aspects of language kind of lead us astray in, in reasoning. And uh, one, one interesting puzzle that I thought I'd mention, uh, something that I've been thinking about, uh, is one that's originally due to Charles Sanders Pierce, the logician and philosopher. Uh, and it, the puzzle is essentially uh, about the non-equivalent, the, the apparent non-equivalence of the uh, English sentences in, in one. Uh, so suppose you return home uh, to, your, to your house that you share with some flatmates uh, and see the lights on. Uh, a natural thing to say in this situation would be the sentence in 1A, either someone broke in or someone left the light on, given that you've inferred that these are the two possible explanations for why the lights, lights are on in the house. Um, but it's quite strange or unnatural to, uh, uh, in the same situation, uh, express your conclusion with the sentence in 1B, uh, someone either broke in or left the light on. Uh, and of course, these sentences are uh, in their translations in, uh, into uh, first order logic are uh, equivalent, uh, which is kind of the kind of the puzzle. And the, the intuition about the sentence in one B is that it, it sort of suggests that you you have in mind that that, uh, that it, it's the same person who who may be responsible for the lights being on, uh, which is kind of incompatible with with the setup of the story. Uh, your housemates didn't, you know, you know that your housemates can't have broken in. <clears throat> so uh, this is a kind of uh, puzzle about uh, language and its connection to the logical uh, the analysis of language using uh, tools and concepts from uh, logic uh, that, I, that I've thought about and worked on. And this is a kind of fun one that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, I'll mention another uh, uh, interesting kind of logical puzzle uh, that's not something of, of the type that linguists have traditionally worked on um, and has been come from the field of uh, psychology where people study the psychological processes of reasoning. So the, the UCL psychologist uh, Weizen uh, famously uh, uh, studied the way people solve certain kinds of conditional reasoning, reasoning problems. Uh, one, of, one of the puzzles he studied is, is, involves a task which is now called the Weizen selection task. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with this, um, but if you if you present uh, subjects with uh, the following task, uh, you get surprising results. So you tell them, you present them with a series of cards, such as pictured on the slide, and you tell them that cards have uh, letters on one side, numbers on the other, and you ask them which ones they need to turn over to determine whether the rule in two, uh, there's two versions of it, uh, one with a conditional, and which was the classic version, and one with a uh, just a universal quantification. And typically they give the logically in, incorrect answer. Um, they, uh, they flip uh, the uh, uh, vowel card uh, and the even card uh, rather than flipping the uh, odd card. And although this uh, has been this has been well studied, there's lots lots known uh, about this puzzle, uh, lots of work from UCL. Uh, but actually even after I think 40 or 50 years, we don't really quite understand why uh, why people have difficult there's not let, let me say that's a loaded statement let me say there's not an agreed understanding of 
uh, why this task is difficult, uh, why, why subjects uh, get it wrong, and, and the factors that ameliorate their performance uh, that have been shown to make their performance better. And so for students, if you're interested in this, uh, for the summer, uh, with my colleague Yasu, Yasu Sudo in linguistics, uh, we have a, a offering a chance to work on a, a summer research internship uh, studying uh, what would, we would call the semantic factors that are involved in, in reasoning with uh, statements like to and solving this kind of task. So uh, in particular, we want to, you know, taking on the uh, results from linguistics uh, using Montague's program, where we now understand a lot of these the kind of formal properties of different constructions of, uh, of natural language. Uh, we want to investigate the ways in which they may be implicated in, in this task. Uh, and so if you're interested in that, you can Google the information at the bottom uh, and you'll find the opportunity to uh, work on that project. So thank you for having me. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, so again, we take questions at the end. Uh, should we move to Lavinia, please? Hi, thank you all for coming and for uh, having me here. So. My journey started a bit with uh, some philosophical questions I was very interested in. The first one was about mathematical truth because I was also, I studied um, mathematics and philosophy at the same time. So all the questions uh, that I had were mostly coming from uh, mathematics and me thinking philosophically about mathematics. Um, sorry, uh, Marouj, um, would it be possible if you mute yourself? Because I hear myself in echo, I think. I'm wondering, yes, sorry, yes. Um, that's cool. Oh, okay, that's perfect, thank you. Um, so the, 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 the first question I was asking myself is, uh, where, where are mathematical truths uh, coming from? Like, why are they true? Like, I've been told them many times, yes, look, they're... Um, infinitely many prime numbers. And when I ask why that's true, they, they say, well, you can prove it uh, in this way. And then I ask about the truth of, of the principles from which uh, they prove this. And at some point, of course, this has to stop, right? And then they say, well, look, um, yeah, it stops here where we have the axioms, uh, that's that's it. And then the <laughs> obvious question is, uh, where? why are the axioms true? And most of my, um, professors both in philosophy and mathematics were somehow um, inclined uh, at the beginning uh, to say things like those are simple truths um, uh, that we somehow uh, got to know but I never got a good uh, explanation of how we, we get to know this and so I've been uh, after that I spent some time uh, reading and getting to know all the uh, alternative views to that um, for instance, the view that says that, well, maybe uh, mathematical axioms are not just uh, uh, basic truths that we somehow manage to uh, connect to using a special um, intellectual ability, but rather perhaps uh, rules that we propose uh, to play a game, like, like as if it were like fictions, uh, bits of, uh, of a fiction we, we're trying to elucidate somehow. And what we're gonna do to do that is basically prove things from those axioms, but uh, those axioms are not uh, privileged in any way or, or perhaps in some ways, but not in, in the way that, uh, not in the sense that they're basic truths uh, that one can intellect somehow. And I really liked this answer. And then I also liked this other answer, uh, which is different and competing uh, in many ways, but not entirely, which is the answer, well, look, these axioms are not stating truths or falsities in a standard way. They're just postulates that are intended to give the meaning of the terms involved in them. So when I say things like um, an axiom like a zero is not the successor of any number, then what I'm telling you is what kind of thing zero is and how a successor behaves. So successor syntactically is a function and zero is a, is a constant. Uh, so it denotes an object and then successor has a first element, so to speak, and, and that one is zero and so on. So I'm, it, the axioms give the meaning and I was uh, quite happy with, with this. So this is one set of um, problem uh, issues uh, that, that concerned me a lot. And the other set were, 
it was about uh, ontological questions. I was like, oh, do these numbers exist? Do sets exist? Uh, do properties exist? And, and all, all of that, propositions. Um, and so and then I studied logic and I thought, okay, logic and philosophy is, uh, and historically is just a discipline that primarily tries to offer a definition of valid argument. And uh, it succeeds uh, in many ways. It, it gives us a definition of valid argument and it develops whole uh, apparatus that manages to do that somehow in, in, in different ways. And I found that uh, a bit uh, boring, okay, knowing exactly what a valid argument is. I already knew more or less what that was because I was doing mathematics, but it's great, it's great to know. That was quite boring at the beginning, but then um, as we moved on to more interesting things in logic, um, I, I found answers to the questions I was asking uh, originally in logic, and this is how I, I got to it. So for instance, the first thing was that um, I learned first order logic, and that was the logic that we used to derive things from our axioms to play the game or to unravel the meanings of the terms involved in axioms. Um, and I, I took a course in, in, in meta theory of first order logic. I learned uh, about the Levenheim's column theorems and uh, the Google theorems, and I realized, hmm, oh, wait a minute. So if um, the game we're playing is, a, uh, is, is, is just laying down these rules and seeing what follows from them, how is it possible that there are things that are somehow true according to, um, obviously true, and we have proofs for them externally, but the rules of the game don't entail them. Uh, and this is what Gödel's uh, theorems uh, were, were saying. And the other thing is, okay, if, if, if these axioms are supposed to fix the meaning of the expressions, how is it possible that I have um, Levenheim's column theorems telling me that actually the axioms don't express what I want? So I thought I had a, an axiom in, in, I have a bunch of axioms in set theory telling me, oh, you should have a countable image many sets and turns out uh, there are ways of interpreting these axioms uh, in which I only have countably many uh, objects around. And so all these um, nice uh, ideas I had uh, gone for and I was happy with started uh, to fall apart and I started uh, then thinking about it, th th these issues in the philosophy of mathematics, including in determinacy and in expressibility. And if I have just, you're, you're muted, sorry. I still know I wasn't going to say something, sorry. Okay, good. so if I have like two more minutes, I can say uh, something about the other uh, branch of things. It would be lovely, yes, because nobody else did. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Maybe one and a half minutes. <laughs> okay, it's perfect, <laughs> thank you. And so, and the other thing was um, and to, to define uh, validity, um, to define the notion of entailment in logic, um, we were using um, the work of, of Tarski. We were defining validity mostly in terms of truth preservation. And the notion of truth was a very complicated one and, and, and before Tarski introduced it properly. And I learned about that and I realized that the, the notion is full of paradoxes and Tarski managed to control those things only by imposing very severe limitations, namely, uh, he defines truth for a language, but uh, that language kind of contain that very same truth predicate. And this uh, means that we don't have a all encompassing definition of truth. We only have a partial definition of truth always. And learning about this fascinated me again. And uh, so I got into truth a lot and to the paradoxes and how to solve them and how to get better definitions of truth that are not so restricted. Um, this was um, something as well. And then finally, um, trying to overcome the problems such as Levenheim's columns and, and Gödel's theorems, um, I, I realized that logics, uh, that, that the logicians had uh, offered some logics in which the languages were uh, more complicated and maybe more expressive in that way. And those languages could prove some, sometimes the existence of the entities that I was worried about, whether they existed or not, like numbers, properties, uh, sets or extensions and so on. So I found in logic, if not answers, um, a lot of uh, work towards the answering of those questions that I liked. Um, 
nowadays, I don't think people are, are so interested in, in this anymore, um, in answering these questions anymore, at least uh, in philosophy. So I hope it's not true that logic is seen both days um, or its days. But I, I fear that we'll have to wait a bit uh, to see logic, uh, yeah, the comeback basically of logic. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, Professor Alzana Russo. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so let's let. Can I check if I can share the screen? Sure. Hold on a second. Yeah, that's fine. Beautiful. Okay, so so if I go, no, sorry, I want to go in a, a presentation mode. Hold on a second, I'll just give me a minute. Um, the full screen? Yeah, I want to go in full screen, I know, I know. So, uh, just a sec, give me a sec. I normally use a, a, a keynote, but... Um, uh, okay, so if you're going full screen here, I'm using PDF at this time. Okay, let me just show now. Uh, okay. Can you see it? Uh, I can see it, yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, okay, everybody. So thank you for having me here. And I just want to pick up on all the last comment. So logic and whether logic and it is still to go ahead in the philosophy or the importance of logic and actually I wanted to close also with a comment that Samson said that they got in the last slide about uh, uh, how what is the position of logic in this uh, space nowadays of noise <laughs> that uh, machine learning and all other aspects of AI are just uh, injecting into our society and life. And uh, really, I strongly believe that logic has got uh, an important uh, uh, task, a duty uh, in, uh, in this uh, endeavor. And what I want to try to very briefly show is the kind of work that I've been doing in my journey in logic, I started as a, a logician, I did my PhD in Peter with Dov Gabay, who is a logician in the model logic and temporal logic, and my PhD was in model logic. So originally I was a logician to start with, and I've then I've taken the challenge that of demonstrating a work towards uh, using this beautiful theory that's been developed uh, in uh, logic and in computational logic and may continue to extend this theory and also make them uh, practical in uh, tackling problems uh, uh, in the real world. So uh, I'm more uh, recently working in an area called logic-based learning and I want to just to tell you a little bit about this and the journey that uh, we've been doing uh, recently. So just starting from very briefly, I know we I have only a few minutes, uh, there are just an uh, anecdote, uh, you know, uh, not uh, true actually statements about what limitations are of, model of uh, machine learning. Uh, Pasquale before was showing uh, mechanisms for machine learning, and uh, these are approaches which are really black box. You know, they make decisions, decisions about the important things in our life, and we don't really know how they came to this decision. So uh, that's something that we need really to defend against, in a sense, as a logicians. And uh, so what the other side of the coin in this kind of uh, um, approach is, is the fact that uh, uh, you, uh, so that there's also another aspect of machine learning, which is logic-based machine learning. So we can actually learn uh, you know, the models so that they can explain the data that we actually observe or the phenomena that we observe and be able to express these models in a kind of a declarative manner so that we are sure about the correctness so we can verify these models. We can apply still all the theory that, uh, you know, Samson was talking about and all the beautiful theoretical results that they are in the program modifications and so forth also on the kind of output that these algorithms will generate. I think this is really important and we really needed to maintain that. So if we then uh, uh, have a look at what is really the definition of symbolic uh, uh, logic-based learning or logic-based machine learning, it's truly really an area that sits in the intersections between machine learning be able to predict on unseen data, but with the soundness and, the, and the semantics, uh, a rigorous underpinning that is really in the area of logic and representation of knowledge using a logic-based formalisms. So this is really, really important. So that's where the, this big area of logic-based machine learning and logic-based learning is actually sitting in. We, I teach a course in Imperial about logic-based learning, which actually is uh, 
gaining a popularity, despite having many other courses on deep learning and machine learning and enforcement learning that tend to be competitors of my option. So I'm quite glad to see the attention that students are actually putting into this uh, subject. Uh, so well, when we are into this field, so what journey we have made into this area, me as a group, but in general as a field, is if you look at all these symbols here in blue, are just all algorithms and systems that were developed uh, in a particular aspect of computational logic, what the people call horn clauses. And they kind of feel that was a, is tend to be labeled as inductive logic programming. But I want to move away from this labeling because it's not really truly logic programming. I'm going to show you in a minute. It's, um, it's broader than that. And then we can take the challenge of pushing the boundary in the theory of developing algorithms which are tractable and effective in learning uh, sort of models, uh, logic based models that are more expressive than horn clauses. So this is the kind of uh, a journey endeavor that uh, I've been taken in the last uh, you know, 15 years, 20 years, and my group is also working on. And we pushed this boundary because we were interested in uh, formalizing or learning a model uh, sort of like theories that can express uh, uh, these junctions or possibility of choices. It's not necessarily uh, just a one particular conclusion given certain uh, uh, antecedents, which is what happens in the horn clauses. We wanted to be able to express uh, also concepts uh, in this logical theory that are constraints. And these constraints can be hard, so they should never be violated, or can be soft constraints. They can be violated by paying some form of penalties. So another interesting thing is, can we combine logic with some concept of optimization? So how can I learn a theory that will lead to a certain conclusion by minimizing a certain penalty in getting to the conclusions, right? So these are all very interesting theoretical concepts. And the challenge is how we can develop systems and algorithms and the mechanism that can automatically generate those concepts from data. So how would I know, Lavina was talking about the axioms are correct. How would I know to, you know, to, to, these are the right one and not some other ones. So this is the kind of uh, uh, work that we've been working on and we really made incredible results here and we pushed the boundary here. So I can talk more if there are questions coming along. So the kind of logic that I think is particularly important is answer set programming in our domain. So this is a computational logical environment which is uh, that based, if you like, uh, on a lot of theoretical work on set solving uh, that looks at the idea of modeling a word, a problem word into a logical language and uh, computing uh, some models of this logical program, this answer set program, which are called answer sets. And the idea is that these models computed by this program correspond actually to the real solution of the real world problem. That's what normally people use in knowledge representation with answer set programming. So how can I model a real world problem in logic? And what we actually do in learning is taking the problem the other way around. So we actually assume, observe events. This can be any events or real world problems or physics or you know, um, kind of you know, behavior of agent in a real world. And from these events of this observation, we want to try to learn the program, the declarative program, that we know model the particular problem in, in place for which we are observing the effect of this particular problem, all right? So that's what we call it in our area, learning answer set programs. And we've been able to really mystify, to deny two big misconceptions that people had in the use of logic in machine learning. And one of the big misconceptions was that, that we, were never, we would never be able to learn automatically program, they are very expressive. So they can talk about all these different concepts of these junctions, choices, constraints, and so forth I was telling before. And also that we, the program that we actually learn, where we learn from data of observation, or we are logic, logic is like an exact theory. How can, how can we solve this kind of problem? And we actually demonstrated that the algorithm that we can develop can also be robust in the presence of noise. So when labels have this kind of errors in, lab, in uh, data have lab, uh, errors in labels. So I have some example here, but I don't have time. So I will just uh, give you an, uh, not in detail, a flavor of what we can learn. So if you think here, this is 
learning the concept of a graph that is Hamiltonian. This is a, you know, quite a hard problem itself. And the reason why I put it up is because it's a logical theory here. So if you like this dot colon dash means an implication. So right to left implication, which has got concept of recursion. So there was a mention of recursion, concept of harder constraints, concept of choices. So something can be either true or false so out of a bag of possible choices. And this is a, just a theory that can be automatically generated from labeled graphs so for label mathematical structures. So can I actually compute automatically this theory that is able now to classify uh, correctly any kind of complex uh, structure? And the beauty of this type of approach is that uh, this kind of theory can be expressed now in English, so they are interpretable. So we had value results that shows how to the accuracy and uh, uh, the robustness with respect to noise. I can go to some of that if I have uh, some questions. But really, where are we going next? What is the next step? So one of the typical criticism that I get as a logician, as somebody working in the logic and machine learning field, is that data actually are not really symbolically represented. The thanks doesn't come to us in logic, comes to us in raw data. So how do we deal with that? How can we make a logic useful also in that context? So one of the work that we're doing in more recently is really trying to uh, use logic, uh, find a way of connecting uh, uh, things, um, algorithm system, they are very good for finding pattern matching. I call it pattern matching, sorry Pasquale, but essentially that's what the deep learning maybe has seen uh, for me. Uh, but I link this to some kind of a mechanism, a theoretical programs uh, and algorithm that, that are able to extract the more high level concepts and theory. So this we call it a hybrid or neurosymbolic approaches. And we've done already some work on that in a kind of a forward pass. So we have some mechanism that we can do the feature structure from raw data. And we now have a way of mapping that into some symbolic representation automatically so that we can learn theories about these data, so, right? And, uh, and we show that we are very, very good in maintaining uh, robustness of this logic-based theory, even though the data, the prediction that is a uh, black box the system can give might not be necessarily accurate. So that's what I mean, learning the presence of noise. So the open question that I want to leave here and then give it to the audience as well, is what we really need to do is try to expand this even further. We need to try to envisage logic as a tool, as a mechanism for expressing knowledge and to be able to learn this knowledge from data by a kind of a long life learning. Human beings never stop learning, right? We learn, we're little, we're young, we learn, we continuous learning and so forth. And system for us should be able to do that, should be able to continuous learning in the, this interaction that the logic and the system has with the real world around us. So I think these are really important questions. These are completely open AI questions. The logician needs, in my view, to take on board and really come up with new theories and new ways of doing that. That is far beyond the just practical experimentation. So I want to leave it there. Thank you so much. Okay, we are out of time. Yes, I'm turning the screen as well. We're going to take a couple of questions. So I'll pass to Alexandra to ask Samson's question first. Then I'll ask one per panel. Um, it's a question to me. No, it's um, it's a question. No, from... I think he meant me. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, I got too many examples here. Yeah, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I think Manush, Manush meant to um, to go back to um, Simon Gay's question on computer scientists bridging the gap of beautiful theory uh, in logic yes. and then the more the complexity of practical computation. I think that this question you know, in terms of what we heard from the panelists working on machine learning, um, this would also, I guess, play a role there. How can you, how can you bridge that gap and how can you use logic to, um, to navigate complexities on the more practical side? Yeah. Um, shall I say a couple of words, a couple of words sure. on this? Or? Sure, go ahead, Samson. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been, I mean, well, I mean, it's of course an, an excellent uh, and a quite deep question from Simon, which we'll have to think about, which are whether we tend to work on the more uh, foundational side or the more uh, applied side. It's a, it's an issue. So I think, you know, as I, as I was saying, I think the sort of the two main approaches in in response to this are either to try and sort of uh, you know, um, uglify the beautiful or beautify the ugly in the sense of either uh, 
try and make formal methods apply directly to languages and systems as they as we have them defined maybe by industry specification documents that may run to thousands of pages and there is work that aims to do that um, and um, on the other hand we may try and um, promulgate more elegant languages more elegant systems and try, try and have an influence on practice through that and i think we need both of those kinds of activities and we can point to examples i think ideas from functional programming types and so on have exerted an influence on um, uh, languages that are used in practice but and there are people who've made uh, some major efforts in, um, in 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 trying to address uh, real systems in all their complexity. I would hope that we'll go forward turning towards elegance because elegance is efficient. Elegance, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the end better and easier to work with more principal definitions. And I mean, just to give a couple of specific points, I recently attended a, a, a Zoom meeting or talk given by um, Stephen Wolfram, founder of uh, Mathematica, uh, this is a very widely used computer algebra system, uh, symbolic computation, and it was actually a talk about the centenary of Schoenfinkel and about combinators, and the Wolfram language has been going essentially going further and further towards being more or less a Haskell-like um, functional programming language. So it's interesting that they've been going in that direction, and some of the other recent languages that have been introduced for that kind of purpose uh, sort of specialized computational purposes are also things like julia and so on are definitely interest uh, influenced by modern programming language ideas and another thing is with quantum computing um we have a new a new chance to kind of get things um you know uh, kind of get things designed in a way that's more in accord with with elegant theory um a couple of uh, some of my former students are now heading uh, research, uh teams in quantum startups and they are using or, int or intending to use these kind of formalisms in the work that they're doing i mean one example has already been used quite a bit is the is the zx calculus which is an elegant uh sort of diagrammatic calculus it's really being used in uh uh quantum compilers and so on but there are other other examples as well so as the technology changes that may give new chances to bring things we have learned into the mix rather than recreating you know the what what, it, what existed before but it is it is certainly a process but um I, I, I remember uh, actually um, in, a, in, the, in a sort of event, the CWI event, uh, Alexandra, that we both attended when uh, the Van Weingarten centenary, I mean, talking in the break to somebody working in a software house in, um, uh, in Amsterdam who was, who was using uh, quite, a, I mean, actually something more advanced than Haskell. I forget what it was. It was either Agda or maybe, um, the uh, so, uh, anyway, but I mean, it was so. I think, uh, and that was seen as a cool thing to do. Yeah, I so, think uh, I think there's more and more of that, and I, I think yes. we are seeing uh, also with the large teams using theorem proving inside Amazon and Facebook. Um, yes, and our very own Peter O'Hearn at UCL. Absolutely, that would be yes. I mean, a, a major major example there. And I mean, I guess I don't know what you're finding with the sort of netcat kind of stuff that. People That's also finding its way into mainstream. Yes. Um, so, I, so I'm actually quite optimistic on that front. Of course, it takes time, but but I think if it penetrates the sort of big tech companies, that's a way into influencing the industry yeah. as a whole. We just must, you know, continue insisting on it, as you said in your at the, in your last slide. We must continue. So uh, yes. thanks, Samson. That's great, and I, I agree. And we have so many examples in which uh, time has shown that elegance is now uh, finding a prime prime place also in industry. So I think we have. Yes. The, the, uh, Edgar Dijkstra had a slogan: "Beauty is our business." Yeah, beauty is our business. <laughs> All right, I'll pass back to Marnoush, who will continue going around. I think. Yeah, just um, a comment on this. Uh, I keep 
meeting people who ask me who are programmers and they work for startups, for example, one is about collecting um, garbage from street is a startup for doing that. But then he's asking me, do you know what's a monad? And then it turns out the CTO of the company is somebody who knows category theory and then wants people to um, use Haskell for writing programs. So I find that interesting. Okay, sorry for divergence. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to ask a question to Robin and one to Nathan and then Renato is going to ask the rest of the questions from the panel. So there is a question and a comment for you, Robin. The comment is, and I had to look this up in the dictionary, the comment is, do you agree that your definition of logic is not negative, but apophatic? And then let me also just ask the question. The question is, you mentioned that the logic of relations is not compositional in the sense that binary relations cannot be decomposed to unary ones. And then um, is there any connection between that and uh, when Samson was talking about non-compositionality in quantum logic? So that's the other question. Okay. Oh, I mean, I, I'm not muted, good. So um, yes, I had to look this one up. Um, so this idea of define, uh, apparently this means uh, that you can, you can describe God by define, uh, by just talking about the negative properties that he doesn't have or something like this. And I'm taking this as a, a purely facetious comment. So I, I generally think it is a way that we learn. Um, we learn, we, we learn, uh, what a color is by pointing out what other things are you know, this is elementary learning so we we can learn things by negatives but it isn't satisfactory as a, a definition of what logic is it, i think it, in reality i think it has to be defined uh positively um now the the question about so i, I don't know if i meant um the way in which relations don't reduce to lower order relations or binary relations don't re reduce to unary relations, um, which was the insight of De Morgan um, and led into this whole subject of relation algebra, but also into Kleene algebras and many others. And whether this is the right tool to use for looking at quantum semantics um, not an expert in quantum logic. It seems to me that it probably is a, a rather in, important part of this analysis. And uh, but be, but I don't think I want to say anything more about that. Uh, so you know, I'll pass on. Uh, okay, fair enough. Unfortunately, there's no time for uh, clarifications and the answers. So I'll ask Nate on a question. Um, so there is a question saying. Uh, oh, I lost it. It's about uh, having children. Oh, okay, here. Given all angles of applying logic, I wonder if there is a good reference on using logic in second language acquisition. Uh, uh, this I, I don't know specifically. Uh, so, uh, generally, uh, within the area of linguistics where I work, um, the focus tends uh, the focus tends to be on uh, on kind of first languages because we know that they're acquired in very different ways than second ones at least insofar as the second language is, is learned as a non like as an adult or as a not as an infant um, and generally the way in which logic is used in my discipline is um, I mean essentially we're studying the natural inferential properties of sentences of human language and using kind of model theory to capture these and so on. So, um, you know, how that would apply to uh, the case of a second language differently than a first, I'm not completely sure, uh, but um, uh, it, uh, so second language acquisition is I think an area of linguistics uh, that is kind of understudied and uh, may, may as the kind of field develops be something that um, provides interesting sources of data for understanding uh, various things about language. And uh, so uh, it's certainly worth thinking uh, thinking in this area, but sorry, I don't have anything more um, 
Thank you. Yeah. Concrete. Um, so Ren Renato, do you want to ask the rest of the question? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> we have one question for Lavinia. Uh, what classic definitions of truth do you mean? Logical proof as one well independent of empirical information, just derived from axioms, or truth as information which has value that is independent of empirical or moral valuation. Um, yeah, thanks, Michal. Um, no, I just mean um, model theory. So Tarski was trying to define uh, the notion of logical consequence in terms of truth preservation, and in doing that he came up with uh, so truth preservation in every interpretation. So he defined interpretation first, which is also very interesting, of course, in these other models. But then uh, he had to define what it means to be true for a sentence or a formula to be true in an interpretation, right, in a model. And this is the definition that Tarski uh, puts forward. I mean, to be honest, this is not the original definition. The original definition from uh, 30, uh, 1931 um, is, is a definition that um, will then evolve into uh, the definition of truth in model theory. It's a definition that um, is basically very similar. It says basically a sentence is true if it's an atomic sentence and basically what it says is the case and if it's an or it's a negation and what it says is not the case or it's a conjunction and both conjuncts are the case. And, and, and so on. So it's a recursive definition of truth. And then uh, only in 56, uh, Tarski formulates uh, his, his definition of, of truth in, in a model or in an interpretation, which is the most famous one. But, uh, but I'm mentioning this one, the last one, because I thought you would be maybe more familiarized with that one. Um, would that answer the question? I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it was a good answer. Perhaps we can uh, switch to the next question, which is also to Lavinia. Um, have you read Truth Through Proof by Alan G. Weir? And if so, how does the thesis of that book fit into your thoughts about logic, incompleteness, and why we use the axioms that we use, and all other questions that you mentioned? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so I have not read the book, but I heard uh, talks by Alan, and talk, I talked myself to Alan as well. And what I find most uh, unconvincing about the view is the fact that he needs to uh, turn to infinitary proofs. So Alan, uh, as far as I understand, um, thinks that there is really no difference between what a proof uh, that is too long is versus an infinitary proof because we cannot follow them, uh, you know, none of them are either. So um, he doesn't, uh, he says, because we are already willing to include uh, any uh, finitary proof, even those that are too long for us to follow, we should also include infinitary proofs. And, and this is how he gets away uh, with um, a formalism that doesn't have, doesn't have to face the problems posed by those completeness theorems. And in, um, I don't really have a good answer why we should consider potentially uh, um, all finitary proofs. However, I am not happy with infinitary proofs. I know that. So maybe his modus ponens is my modus tollens and I would reject actually very long proofs as well. My um, original question uh, had to do a lot with epistemology. So it had to do with, uh, okay, if, if the axioms of mathematics are, um, rules of a game we, we, we lay down to play and maybe moreover they're there to give us the meaning of the terms that we're gonna use in the game. Um, that we should be able to understand those meanings. We should be able to um, play the game. I think if we, if infinitary proofs are involved, we are no longer playing the game. The game is no longer designed for us. Um, so, I could uh, give better answers, I guess, uh, uh, but it would take a bit longer. Sure, thanks. Thank um, so I think we have a last question, which is actually a sequence of questions. Uh, I can just uh, ask them and then see how it goes. 
So do you think logics be thought of as compositions of observations made by agents in an environment? And simpler the agent and the environment, the more powerful the logic? So this is one question to the general uh, panel, I think. And then the second question is, do you think thought experiments about agents and environments become powerful ways of driving new logic? And the, quest the last question is, do logicians think of themselves as agents in an environment? Does somebody wants to try to answer this. Uh, maybe we can ask Pasquale and Alessandro because yeah, so the, I was about to step in. So the, could you, which one is the first question? Can I can I also suggest there's another question to Alessandra? I believe, even though they called Alexandra, but I think it's for you. Uh, okay. When do you see the logic playing a good role in explaining neural models? And then they say natural language or vision-based models. Okay, so that's an interesting please question. So, for Pasquale as well. Okay, so yeah, Pasquale too, please step in if you want. Uh, Sorry, so can you say the question again? So where the logic could be playing a good role in explaining when the logic can play a good role in explaining a neural model in the case of natural language or in the case of visual based models. So I can give it from my experience in general. So we are addressing both failures. So for instance, uh, we, we, we did work on the using logic to capture the semantics of natural language processing and uh, help uh, learning, uh, uh, help uh, text comprehension, if you like. So we used the uh, CCG, combinatorial categorical grammar, that uh, capture the compositionality of semantics in natural language. Uh, uh, in natural language. And uh, we, we had a way of uh, uh, expressing uh, directly for, not for free and structured text into the answer set and logic uh, programs that I was referring to uh, automatically. And we were able to, and I could, this can link it to one of the questions as well in the chat, we were able to learn the common sense principles that the humans, uh, or some of the common sense principles the humans use when they need to try to answer questions about a passage written in natural language. Because uh, the answer to this passage in natural language don't necessarily come directly from the text. So human is agents, so they have the logical theory of the common sense of how the life works. They can use that particular knowledge to construct answers to questions. So if you have a mechanism of capturing the logically the semantics of the text, expressing not structural language, and also learn some of these common sense principles, you can make the agent now, this is a computational agent, not a human and logician agent, you can make the computational agent able to perform better in these situations, right? So natural language is clearly a good idea. And the visual, uh, so the other aspect was uh, visual models. So that's uh, also a challenge. So it's a bit harder because you can't go directly from pixels to symbols, uh, they, nobody would do that. I don't think this is the right thing to do. So you needed to have some kind of intermediate process of feature structure from, from pixels, which are an image. Pasquale might say more about that maybe. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, the high level concepts uh, which can be uh, used to understand better, so the images as well, could definitely be things that can be learned in a logical sense. So Pasquale, I'll leave it to you then too. So like one super quick, super quick comment about this. So um, actually um, kind of logic kind of explanations are used to provide uh, post hoc explanations for the predictions. So basically uh, many people do like, do like this. They take a deep learning model and then they approximate either locally or globally based on the instance. Um, the deep learning model using something explainable and interpretable like addition tree or something else that can be interpreted by humans. Um, and that's a way of getting explanations out of a deep learning model. The problem is you are working with an approximation of the model. You are not working with the model. Maybe the model is working differently internally. Maybe the model is looking at something that you shouldn't look at internally, but we don't know that. Uh, and that's one problem with this paradigm. Maybe, maybe, maybe the model is looking at some annotation artifacts. Um, something that you shouldn't look at because one thing about deep learning models is that they love to cheat in some sense. So any way that um, that works for producing accurate predictions, even if this way is not legal or not 
cl close to what should be in some sense, according to humans. If it works for the model, the model will just, will just go with it. And we don't have a way with current postdoc explanation models to find whether the model is giving us the correct prediction for the correct reasons or for the wrong reasons. So yeah, that's it. So we can get, exp we can approximate explanations with kind of um, more logical methods, but we don't know whether those explanations reflect how the model works internally. And yeah, that, that was the only thing I wanted to say, because maybe the model is doing something completely different internally, but we don't know that because we are not working with the model, we are working with the approximation. So do you think the real system might be more logical or less logical than the approximation? We don't know, because the, the model is just um, a sequence. Uh, if we're doing computer vision, the model is just a sequence of nonlinear transformations. And who knows what, what it's doing. We can try to approximate this model with something we can interpret, like addition tree or something else, like a logic theory or, or something else. but. We don't know how faithful, how faithful this approximation is to the original model. Yeah, I think one thing yeah. that bothers me a lot with current machine learning, basically. Yeah, that's the thing I wanted to say. Okay, good. So we have one uh, last uh, quick question to Alessandra. Uh, what paper would you recommend for the survey of inductive logic programming, answer set programming? Ah, so it depends on what you're interested to find out. <laughs> if you're interested to find out the theory behind uh, the answer set programming and the learning of answer set programming, which is what we have been developing in the last, uh, you know, five, six years, seven years, there is a very nice theoretical paper in the AI journal that I can recommend that actually explore also the complexity of uh, ta learning tasks. So, so how complex is the computation? Is it the decidability problem of deciding the satisfiability problem of a learning problem or learning task? So if I have a learn a task to learn, to solve, uh, what is the complexity of deciding that such a task accept a possible solution? So that there is any possible solution for such task. So we've done a lot of theoretical work in approving the complexity of the different type of learning problems in the context of answer set of programming. So I would recommend the AIJ paper, and you can find them in my DBP LP. Uh, sort of bibliography, uh, and it's got many other citations there that will take you back to other area of IP as well. So that's one part. Uh, for the actual uh, application, uh, more applied stuff of inductive logic programming or learning as a set. So we we push the boundary. And inductive logic programming is very finalized to definite clauses and whole clauses, and I think logic is more than that. So and that's why why I want to talk about learning, uh, you know, logic-based learning other than IRP. So we've done a variety of papers on different application domains, ranging from learning policies from real data and network to, to understand the security constraints to put a network to more like uh, um, theoretical problems like I was described before the Hamiltonian graph, which can apply in many, many different domains. So I think uh, there isn't a survey as such. We have an article, an invited article in the newsletter of uh, ALP, which is the Association for Logic Programming. They invited to write a summary. There can be a nice, uh, concise uh, article that people can read and there are other reference points from that. So I would be happy to share that if there is a, you know, the person would email me, I'm happy to forward the, uh, the references for that. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, we are coming to half an hour being over time. And I think that was a very good end of uh, World Logic Day by recommending a logic paper <laughs> to the audience. <laughs> okay, so I feel it's been in general, uh, the discussions were in favor of logic, I, I think at the end, we end with a good conclusion there. We and choose the panelists in the right way to have a discussion <laughs> in favor of logic. Yeah. So I actually, maybe I want to just quickly, quickly say, I'm really a strong advocate for that. So, and, uh, in, uh, you know, in our department, uh, we fight a lot to maintain logic in the, in the curriculum of students from first year to fourth year with a natural progression of complexity of the theory that we teach. And I think going back to what Sam said, we really need to maintain. So we really needed to, uh, I, I know maybe logic-based learning might appear like 
a, you know, just an AI thing, but actually it's not. There's a lot of theoretical work that can be done behind that. So in guarantee optimizations in this solution that you compute and the semantics and the soundness, the completeness, there's all the theoretical underpinning. So I think logic is really something that has, you know, we, I'm really strong that it stays alive and it doesn't get swamped by, <laughs> by, by other aspects and noises in the environment, as <laughs> Samson says. Okay, um, it's sad, but should we say goodbye? <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you very everyone. much for inviting us. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.